Hallelujah. I mean, he's glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I want to be like David. Let me dwell in the house of the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. I don't want it to be just an occasional event. It needs to be something that is constantly in our minds and our hearts to be in his presence in the sanctuary. Amen. I know he's everywhere. He's omnipresent. That means he's everywhere at once. You can't escape his presence. David found that out, didn't he? But there's something special about the sanctuary. This is where he meets with God's people. The Solomon dedicated the temple to him. The scripture says that they couldn't minister in the temple because of the glory of God that descended into the temple. When the Ark of the Covenant was dedicated, the Spirit of God hovered over the Ark. There is a, there's something to be said for the sanctuary. Something to be said for the place where God's people comes to worship and where God's people gathers together. Thank God he's omnipresent, but aren't you glad there's a special place of his presence where we can come and know he's come here to meet us. Every person here this morning can come in contact with him right here, right now. It's a special place. Aren't you glad to be in the special place? The special place. The house of God. Amen. So good to see all of you here. Thank you for being here on this spring day in February 2016. I looked out today and I thought, my Lord, we're going to have to start mowing the grass, Brother Jerry. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Now, don't get your hopes up. February's not over yet. March is not over yet. Amen. Amen. We got some cold weather that's going to uh, happen before this is all said and done, I'm sure. But this has been a, a nice break from the cold, and it's good to see all of you out and about, especially our guest here this morning. Thank you for being here. Mark chapter number 4 this morning, beginning with verse number 35. And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked not the disciples, but the wind, and saith unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased. There was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Amen. Last week I talked to you about it never happened on this a, a matter. It never happened like this before. This occasion is eventful and special. This morning, I want to talk to you about one that's similar, about the same man. Amen. Let me talk to you about what manner of man is this? What manner of man is this? Aren't you glad that we serve the one that is able to do exceeding, abundant, 
above all we can ask or even think. But we get involved in it too, don't we? According to the power that worketh within us, we activate the power of God. It's not enough just to have him around, have him present, but we've got to activate him. Aren't you glad for the mercy and the kindness of God that deals with us? Amen. Praise God. God bless you. I'm going to let you shake your neighbor's hand before you're seated. Tell the person next to you to have a blessed day and be blessed. Amen. It's been a strenuous day in the life of Christ. It began with blasphemous accusations by the Pharisees that he was controlled by Beelzebub, the prince of the devil. It was a fierce confrontation. And then his mother and his brother, his family got involved. Anybody have bad days like that? <laughs> the devil's involved and the family's involved. His mother and his brothers had attempted to kidnap him and take him back to Nazareth because they thought that he was out of his mind. Next, leaving the crowded house, he went down by the sea where among a great press, he began to teach in parables. So large was the crowd that surrounded him that he had to get into a boat and teach the rest of the day from the boat to the crowd that was pressing him in the hot sun of the day. Finally, when the day was coming to an end, Jesus no doubt was exhausted. Remember, he was a man like as we are, the scripture says, yet without sin. And so the strenuous activity of the day, the pressures of the accusers, the pressures of his family, the pressures of his commitments to those around him. Anybody have days with all of that going on? You know how tired you are on a Wednesday night when you get here for service? Amen? As a matter of fact, any other day that we spend our day dealing with all those kinds of things. Finally, when the day was coming to an end, Jesus exhausted, gave the order to launch the boat. Verses 35 and 36 say, In the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. In the original tense of that verse, it reveals a, a time and a note of urgency in Jesus' decision to depart then. Let's go right now. Let's don't drag our feet. Cast away from the shore immediately. That's the tense of this verse. Maybe he was so tired that like a lot of us, he had hit the wall. The end of the day, the end of all the activities, the end of the teaching, the end of being pressed about, he was so tired that he just couldn't go any further and he wanted them to cast the boat from the shore. 
At any rate, in the shadows of the evening that was approaching, Jesus moved to the stern of the, the boat that they were in where he, because of his weariness, retired on a pillow, the scripture says. The boat raised its sail, began to sail away from the shore across the Sea of Galilee, a five-mile trip, followed by a lot of small vessels that were following them. Must have been a beautiful sight. Stars beginning to peek out from the sky, a gentle breeze blowing into the sail of the boat, them drifting away from the shore, the disciples standing around the edges of the boat watching as the shoreline recedes with all the multitude drifting back to their homes. Jesus down in the ship on a pillow, wore completely out, exhausted, had fallen asleep. What a beautiful picture. And all of a sudden, a blast hits them and the wind picks up and a storm begins to blow. The Sea of Galilee is 628 feet below sea level. It is surrounded by mountains and those mountains have very deep ravines cut into them by erosion. These ravines serve as wind tunnels that the wind blows down onto the lake through. And it often agitates the thermal buildup in the valley below, which when it rises, pulls down and sucks down the colder air into the lake. Our text says in verse 37, there arose a great storm of wind. And the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. Here again, the original rendering pictures the waves as they constantly crash into the boat and begin to literally fill the boat that they were in up with water. Matthew uses the word in the original in his interpretation of this same reading. He uses a Greek word, seismos, which literally means earthquake to describe this storm. It was as though the sea itself began to shake under the blast of the storm and the winds that was blowing across it and began to shake as though it was in the midst of an earthquake. Anyone that's been in a storm in a boat has an idea, kinda, of what was going on. I remember as a young boy being out in a boat in a storm, the white caps were high, the waves were high. We were trying to get back to the shore in a little old wooden boat and had that thing turn wide open and those waves were hitting the front of that boat and knocked a hole in the front of the boat. You remember that? That's an unforgettable experience. Amen. And the boat began to fill with water. Anybody that has experienced that knows the fear that goes along with that. At any moment, that boat could have gone under. Amen. The up and down of the waves in the sea, no doubt like going up in an elevator, coming down on a roller coaster. Going up in an elevator, coming down on a roller coaster. Down into the trough of those waves. You can imagine the fear that gripped those hardened fishermen as the wind began to shake everything around them and everything around them was disturbed. Amen. They had no way of knowing it at that particular moment in time. But that 
storm that they were in was a vehicle teaching them about God and his power in their lives. I'm going to say it again because I want you to understand this is the crux of what I want to talk to you about. The storm was the vehicle to teach them important lessons about God's power and authority in their individual lives. How many is in a storm this morning? Nobody in a storm? Oh yeah, you just don't want to admit you're in a storm. Well, maybe you just are coming out of a storm. Maybe you're just going into a storm, but irregardless, there's a storm brewing somewhere in your life. And I want you to know this morning that storms are nothing to fear when God is in the boat. Storms are teaching aids to tell us and teach us some things about the goodness and the kindness of God in our life. You see, without difficulties and trials and stresses and even failures, we'd never grow. We'd be stagnant. We'd be the same. Nothing would ever change in our life. You know it. Some of you would never pray if God didn't bring storms into your life. Some of you would never call on God for help if there weren't storms and stresses in your life. If you didn't find yourself surrounded by the wind and the waves of the things around you that are beating against you. Storms are a part of the process of spiritual growth. I've heard some folks that's had the Holy Ghost for a long time express the fact that everything that has made them what they are has come through affliction. You know when you grow the most? In affliction, in a storm, in a trial. Why? Why do you grow the most in a storm? Because you know you can't control it and there's only one that can and you go to the one that can. Isn't it a shame that we wait until we get in a storm to call on him? Amen. But as human nature is, that's where we are. We need to pray, Lord, in our storm, help us to ride it out and get to you. Help us to get through the storm by your help and get to you and understand that you're in control of our lives. The storm was a step up for the disciples. They didn't really know it at the time. They thought it was a bad thing. Maybe you have a storm going on right now. You think it's a bad thing. Why don't you turn the tables on your fears this morning? Why don't you just tell the Lord, Lord, I know you're with me. I know this storm's for a reason. I know I'm going through this for a reason. And by your help and grace and with your hand upon me, I'm going to ride the storm out and I'm going to be better for it. I'm going to be stronger for it. I'm going to be closer to you for it. Storm continued to blow. The storm continued to blow with all of its violence against the ship and against those in the ship. The sails were in rags. Everything was covered in water. The boat was filling up. And where was Jesus? Verse 38 says, In the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. I love that. The old boat was rocking and filling up with water and the, 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 the sails were in tatters. The people on the boat, the disciples, were screaming and hollering and hanging on to stuff. And Jesus was in the hinder part of the ship. He was wore completely out. 
You know how tired you get when you can just go to sleep in the midst of all the grandkids hollering at you? The wife making demands on you? Amen. Phones ringing. Right? You know what I'm talking about. You ever been tired enough that you sit down when you got in, you sat in a chair, you didn't go to bed, you just sat in a chair and went to sleep. You just fell asleep in the chair. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I do it a lot. You can ask my wife. I do it a lot. Just wore completely out, mentally and physically worn out, and you can sleep through a storm like Jesus was asleep while all of this activity was going on. Uh, you know, it's an amazing thing to me that why is it that we're always awake and active and trying to figure everything out and trying to change everything around us and trying to make this happen and stop that from happening in the time of storm and tribulation and trial and Jesus is standing over with his arms crossed, I just kind of got this pictured, watching us with a smirk on his face. Amen. Smiling. Thinking, that's my creation right there. I made them. I put them together. They're really showing up right now, aren't they? That Jesus could sleep in the hinder part of the ship was at least as remarkable as the storm that was blowing around the ship. It's just, it's just, it's unbelievable. That's what the disciples were thinking. The Lord was fast asleep on the hard boards that made up the ship on a pillow. Amen. And by the way, he wasn't pretending. He wasn't just laying there with his eyes closed. He was asleep. Howling wind, wet spray blowing everywhere. Totally exhausted and asleep. You know, this, this is a perfect example of the incarnation. God manifest in the flesh. Amen. God wasn't afraid of the storm and the body was wore completely out and asleep. All there demonstrated in this particular instance. He had a human body just like ours, but all of the Godhead bodily dwelt in him, the scripture says. In a moment, Jesus was going to step on the bow of the ship and he was going to display his power. But first, he needed some bodily rest. This picture, the opposites of weakness and omnipresence clash. Amen. The opposites of weakness and omnipotence clash. Praise God. I want you to see this because I want you to understand it's no ordinary somebody that's on your boat. It's not some doctor that has partial understanding in your case, Sister Lorraine. It's not a doctor that can just do surgery. Are you with me this morning? It's not just an attorney that can deal with you and try to help you through your situation. It's not some psychiatrist or psychologist that lays you on a sofa and tries to explain away your hurts and your pain when he's trying to explain away what's bugging him all along too. Just a man talking to another man. This was God manifest in the flesh that's on the boat. This was the incarnation of the one that spoke everything into existence on the boat. And yet, he was wearied and he was asleep. 
What beautiful harmony we have here. Amen. Amen. The main point here is that the disciples, Christ to them seemed unaware and uncaring that their boat was about to go under. That's how they perceived him when he was asleep on the boat. They perceived him as not caring. He wouldn't be asleep if he cared. He wouldn't be down there in the hinder part of the boat. Look at all the stuff going on in my life. And Jesus don't really care. He'd be up here doing something about it, thank God. Come on, come on, come on. Right? He wouldn't let this happen to me if he really loved me. Sometimes I think we're not even on the boat. You know, our minds are somewhere else. We forgot all about who's on the boat with us. We're thinking about Dr. So-and-so, Attorney So-and-so, amen, DHS, gonna give me a handout, fix my problem. The government will solve it for me. Oh, yeah. Come on, folks. You need to understand where you are and who you are. And not only that, you need to understand the presence of the one that's on the boat with you today. You need to understand this isn't just another man. This isn't just another occasion for somebody to help you that's really helpless to help you. This is God himself manifesting the flesh, the creator of everything that's on the boat with you. What's your problem anyway? What are you complaining about? You think you don't care. Huh. You know, the flesh of Christ was always under subjection to the Spirit of God. Throughout the Scripture, the New Testament tells us time and time again, I do only those things that my Father speaks to me to do. And right now, the Spirit was with him, on him, in him, the flesh part of him was asleep, but the spirit was in control. Amen. How many of you got the Holy Ghost here today? Anybody got the Holy Ghost? You know what the Holy Ghost is, don't you? What is the Holy Ghost anyway? Isn't the Holy Ghost the spirit of God? Isn't that what the Holy Ghost is? Isn't it? If you've got the Holy Ghost, guess who is in your boat? <laughs> Guess who is in the bow, in the hinder part of the ship, asleep this morning, and you think he's forgotten all about you, but he's still there. That's why Jesus could tell those disciples when he was about to depart from them, he said, my peace I leave with you. Amen. I'm fixing to send something into your life that will give you peace in the midst of the storm. I'm fixing to give you something that no matter what's going on around you, no matter what's going on all around you is beating against you, all the persecutions, all the trials, all the things that's going on in your life, you can have peace in the midst of the storm. Why? Because I'm fixing to be there with you. I'm fixing to be on the boat with you. I'm fixing to help you. You need to believe that. You need to believe that. Now you let Sister McQuay do what Sister McQuay's doing. You hear me? Because I'm gonna tell you something. When you recognize who's on the boat with you, it doesn't matter the situation that's in your life. You can deal with it. You can come to terms with it. You can let it happen. Why? Because the master is there.
Jesus, Jesus could sleep because he knew who was in control. Amen. There's a perception out there that I want to take care of right now. And that perception is that Christ apparently seems to ignore our misery. He seems to be a million miles away somewhere when I'm in trouble and I need him most, that he's forsaken me. And if you got the Holy Ghost here today, you got to remember the Holy Ghost is not going to leave you just because you're in trouble. God's not going to forsake you just because you're in trouble. It's because bad things happen to good people. He's not going to run off and leave you and, 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 and say, well, I'll see you later, fella. You get through this by yourself and then I'll show up again. No, 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 no. The misconception that the world tries to foster on us that if we're going through a bad time, God's not with us. Often we mistakenly conclude that we're alone when we're not. Amen? God knows every wave that beats against your ship. He knows the rate of our hearts. He knows our respiration. He knows the innermost thoughts in our minds. He knows our emotions. He knows every dream that we dream. The tiny boat carrying the Lord and the disciples was the object of heaven's attention. And so it is in our difficulties, even in death. Are you hearing me? Even in death, he doesn't forsake us. The storm was necessary for the disciples' spiritual development. And they're necessary for you. There was a calm on its way. But before the calm got there, there had to be the storm for the disciples' sake. The storm was necessary. Verse 38. Frantically they awake him. I put the frantically in there. And say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Does that sound familiar? Their rebuke of the Lord was unfounded in the light that he never quits caring about us. Amen? Especially if you're his disciple. Especially. Certainly he cared. Lord, do you care about me? Certainly he cares. But we can't expect rationality from a, our own thinking when we're in the midst of a storm, can we? We lose our ability to be spiritual, it seems like, when we're in the midst of a storm. What's the first thing you do when a storm hits? You try to figure out how to solve the storm in your life. Instead of going to God in prayer and falling on your face and getting in a prayer room somewhere and turning everything over to Him, what do we do? We immediately put it in gear and get to thinking, what can I do to solve this problem? And you can't do anything. How are you going to stop the wind from blowing? How are you going to speak to the waves and they lay flat? How are you going to stop the rain from falling? How are you going to keep the water from filling your boat up? How are you going to do all that? You're not going to do any of that. So why don't you just come to terms? Jesus is in the boat and he cares for you. Why don't we just get that up front? Why don't we figure this out? Maybe they 
ran down there and began to shake him. Amen. Jesus, Jesus, are you awake? Sure he was awake. Wouldn't you be awake if somebody shook you? Sure he was awake. Verse 39 says, He arose, he rebuked the wind, said unto the sea, Peace be still. Literally, that means be muzzled. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. The tense of that again in the original means immediately the wind stopped blowing. Mm. Immediately, there was a sudden calm. There was an eerie silence as if, as if a great hand just reached down and shoved the wind out of the pitcher and laid its hand across the lake and everything immediately was just like on a clear, beautiful afternoon. to total and complete peace in a moment's time. Don't you know there was some gulping going on by the disciples? They went from the extreme of fear to the extreme of peaceful existence. How many of you have ever had that happen to you when Jesus spoke the word? Boom, bam, just like that. And a great calm. And the waves laid down, and the wind quit blowing. Maybe some of them sat down wide-eyed, not understanding how this could happen, thinking they was in the twilight zone. What's going on? Here again, no wonder Jesus said what he said about them. You know, aren't we strange beings that we go to doctors that put a stethoscope on our chest, tell us our heart's beating, great, you're in good shape. And we believe them. They suck the blood out of our arm and they send it off to some lab to a person that we don't even know what they're up to. And they send back a report that everything's okay and we believe them. The doctor may prescribe some medication for us. We don't have an idea. We can't even read his writing. It's just a bunch of, just a bunch of scribbling on a piece of paper, and we take that piece of paper and we give it to a pharmacist. Some of the pharmacists that I've given that piece of paper to look like the dog catcher instead of the pharmacist. And yet we give that piece of paper to that pharmacist. He fills that and puts a bunch of stuff in a little old container. We've never seen that before. We, never, we don't even know what it is. We look at that and still can't read it and it's typed out. And we go and do what he tells us to do. Take two of these a day, three times a day, and in six days you'll be fine. And we do it without question. But the pastor says, you need to come and get in the prayer room early tonight. Because it'll fix your problem spiritually. And nobody shows up. Maybe I ought to start wearing a white coat. Richard Whittington. DD on it. Dumb doctor. Thank you. We're strange creatures, aren't we? We believe people we have no confidence in, can't have confidence in because we don't know them. We don't know what they're up to, but we believe them. And yet we won't believe what the Lord's trying to tell us what the Spirit's trying to tell us. 
Amen. The truth was that though it would take a little time, though it would take a little bit of travel down the road with him, they were going to understand some things about this whole process of walking with him. All the power belongs to him. It's not in the things around us. Those things have no power over us. Paul would tell the Colossians in the first chapter, verse 16, about the creator. For by him, by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. Are you with me? Visible, invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Every speck of cosmic dust that's floating around out there was created by him. Every atom in your body is created by him. Everything that exists was spoken into existence by him. And not only that, it was created for him. That means that you're created for him. Everything. Aren't we strange creatures? that we're God created and we won't take the prescription he gives us to solve the problems of our lives. We'll run around and try to find every other answer we possibly can and leave him completely out of the picture and think that we can solve our problem. Look, let me get something across to you. He is the creator of everything. He don't need any help. Neither do you. I'm not preaching against doctors and dentists. Boy, I hate to go to dentist. I got to go to a doctor tomorrow, have a checkup. I hate it. The worst thing about it is I can't eat for, you know, 24 hours before you go or whatever. But I'll do everything he tells me to do. We're strange creatures, aren't we? Why don't you just take God at his word? Why don't you just do what he's prescribing for you to do this morning? Why don't you just realize and recognize the fact he's on your boat? He's not only the creator. That same verse, the 17th verse says he's a sustainer. He is before all things and by him all things consist. All things consist. Man. Scientists spend thousands and thousands of dollars and years of experimenting trying to figure out the mysteries that God set into place. He's the glue that holds it all together. That's what they need to understand. Not only is he the creator and sustainer, he's the goal. Verse 16 again says, all things were created by him and for him. Don't think for one minute the Grand Canyon is for you to go look at on your vacation. Don't think the beach is for you to go lay out in the sun and enjoy as the waves roll in. That stuff wasn't created for you. How many of you thought that was created for you? Come on, don't lie to me. Brother Benny did. That stuff wasn't created for you to go on vacation and enjoy. Those deer wasn't put out there for y'all to kill. <laughs> Kevin, those fish wasn't put out there for you to catch. You know why they're there? For him. And you know why you're here this morning? For him. Quit trying to do all of this stuff without him involved in your life. Get him on board. He's the one that can take care of your problems. 
problem. If you believe this, you'll weather the storms of life. The disciples would learn it well. In fact, Peter, who was the principal source for Mark's gospel, in writing his account, would one day encourage us to welcome trials as friends because they would develop us. Peter learned the storm theology. Amen. It was not a theory. For Peter, he experienced about anything you can experience. Whip, stone, in prison. You name it. But he recognized that the hurricane of affliction was just waiting for the one to step out and say, peace, be still. And the waves would lay down and there would be a great calm. He knew the power that was vested in Christ. See, in their fear, and I'm closing, Mark 440 says, seeing their fear, he addressed his disciples in silence of their thinking and their wondering and their surmising. And he said, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Notice that. And then that 41st verse says, they said, what manner of man is this? That the wind and the sea obey him. They were learning a very important lesson and it's a lesson we all need to learn and that's the lesson of faith. Stand with me. Don't put your confidence in external helps. Get Jesus on board your ship and let him instill the faith of God in you to believe that he can do anything that needs to be done in your life and everything in your life that's being done is because he orchestrated it. Doesn't the scripture say that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose? Is that not what scripture says? Not some things, all things. The good things, the bad things, the ugly things, the storms of life, the good times, the bad times, the things you understand, the things you don't understand, all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord. I don't know about you, but I want him on my boat. I want him on board of my boat. Because when a storm comes up, even though he's asleep and seemingly he doesn't care and he doesn't know where I'm at, I know the one that's there. And I've got faith in him. Jesus will never tell you, and in fact, if he's on board and he tells you to do something, you're going to survive it. You didn't hear me. He told them to get in the boat and let's go to the other side. That meant they were going to get there. He can't lie about stuff like that. If he said they was going to the other side, they're going to get to the other side. It doesn't matter what happens between here and there. They're going to make it. If you got the Holy Ghost here this morning, you're going to make it. I said you're going to make it. 
And if you don't have the Holy Ghost, let me invite you to invite him to get on your boat this morning. How would you like to have somebody that steps out and says, peace be still in your life? There ought to be people coming to the front right now. There ought to be people coming to the front right now to get him on board. There ought to be people saying, I want him on board my boat. I want him because I know that he's the only one that can help me. I don't have any confidence in anybody else, but I got confidence in him. be still the wind lays down the sea lays down your circumstances lay down your problems disappear God 